You're listening to an exclusive interview on WNS. Okay, folks, joining us on the show this week, he is a former WWE superstar. He was one half of the VOD villains. You know him as Simon Gotch. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Oh, we certainly appreciate your time. And uh, for all things Simon Gotch, or now I should say Simon Grimm, you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Gotch Style WWE. So once again, thank you uh, for taking time to come on to the show. Um, I know following your recent departure from WWE, I'm sure your uh, your phone has been blowing up with, with interview opportunities and uh, different appearances. So we thank you for uh, for coming on to our show. Oh, not a problem, but we actually have a mutual friend. Uh, he, he's an artist, uh, old John David there, uh, creator of uh, is Monster Wrestling. Uh, Nightmare Monster Pro Wrestling. Wrestling. Federation. Yeah, so uh, I, I, was, uh, I was directed here by a friend of mine who actually made one of my T-shirts. So i giving you guys a, a nice little talk because you seem like you, you want to have some, some chatting. Absolutely. Entertaining type deal. Yeah, you you reached out to our buddy John David Garrett from Nightmare Pro Wrestling. He, good dude. And uh, the the shirt actually was just uh, revealed, and it looks awesome. And uh, for if anyone wants to check it out and get their own t shirt, you can go to prowrestlingtees dot com slash Simon Says. So uh, the first question I have to ask you: How did you find John's work? Like, what drew you to him? Um, I actually came across his work on Instagram, and I, I thought it was wonderful. And I actually uh, purchased several of the comic books just on the artwork alone. I had no idea what the storyline was. I just knew it was you know giant monsters pro wrestling, and I went, "This is brilliant." That's <laughs> pretty much my two favorite things in the world mixed together. And uh, just over the over the last uh, year and a half or so, I just kept in contact with him. And when uh, when my release came, obviously the idea of doing my own merchandise came up, and he was one of the artists I tapped. And I mean, I. It's always important to me to be able to work with professional artists and be able to, it's going to sound weird, be able to actually compensate them because if you've done any artwork, especially on the internet, the old promise of you'll get exposure is like, mm-hmm. it's the worst thing to hear at the end of a, a conversation about art or about any sort of professional artwork. So um, John's professional, so it was, it was just one of those things where it's like, I'd like to work with someone who, you know, he's going to know what his time is worth, he's going to be able to give me a real price, and we can jam this thing out and he'll deliver a quality product uh, and I've, I've been fortunate enough that a couple of other shirts I've had done it's the same deal where I've been able to contact guys who do good do good work and are professional and you know I'm very proud of what they've done absolutely and uh, I know we can certainly at attest to uh, to John's craft he is certainly a professional we've uh, we've commissioned him to do several uh, yeah. works of art for us yeah. uh, so it's really it's really cool and the fact that you know someone who has been into the WWE see I had a theory that maybe uh you saw Xavier Woods' art that he had reached out to to John for the uh, for the booty hose, and I figured maybe he went around backstage showing everybody. I honestly had never. I don't think I, I met him ever before. I might be mistaken on that, but no, I, I remember seeing that piece, and I was very let down when I saw the actual product that was produced, <laughs> just because I thought John's was so much better artistically. Like the the design was pretty much the same, mm-hmm. but some I, I put this. Some art has a has a feeling of emotion to it, like a like there's. There's been something put into it by the creator, a passion, one might say. And then there's some art that feels like it was someone doing a job and just kind of completing it. And John's work always feels very passionate. Like, it's clearly done by someone who loves wrestling and wants to wants to depict it in a certain light. So it, it's just it's something that happens sometimes. It's unfortunate when it, you kind of have to go through the uh, – it's like, well, we like the idea, but we have to go through the corporate channel because mm-hmm. these are the people we have contracts with, or these are the people we have in our employ, and we can't really outsource this stuff. But, you know, it does happen that way sometimes. It sucks the energy away from it. <laughs> you said it, not me. You said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of like all this artwork and stuff, are you into like comic books in general? Oh yeah, um, I've actually been a big follower of uh, comic books since I was a child. Uh, I even uh, I don't have it with me. It's still in California with my brother. I have a, a Jim Lee original of Wolverine. Nice. He drew it at WonderCon in 1991, I believe, Whoa. in record time that day. I don't know if the record still stands. It was something like 27 seconds. Good. He drew oh, wow. a profile of Wolverine. That's awesome. Um, oh yeah, and uh, I still I still collect pretty regularly. Uh, I'm big I'm a big fan of Eric Powell, who does the Goon, as well as uh, uh, Big Man Plan, and uh, I believe it's a uh, it's one about the I think it's called Hillbilly. I believe is the new one. Okay. Uh, just really sort of macabre rockabilly style work. It's it's very entertaining <laughs> stuff. And uh, the spread is actually another one I'm very fond of. If you if you're an, into any sort of zombie type uh, type media, or if you're just a fan of the thing, the uh, John Carpenter version, uh, it's a hell of a comic to check out. Cool, 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 man. That's awesome. 
Yeah, we've all, we've always had the theory uh, over the course of years that there is that blurring of the lines between wrestling and comics. You know, it's it, there's not that much of a difference. So it's really cool to hear you know the wrestlers that that are comic fans. It's actually you'd be surprised the guys that are. Um, one one that actually shocked me. He's no longer with the company. Um, uh, his name is Alex Jones. He, he used the name Troy McLean in uh, NXT, and I didn't know this. We, we were doing like an improv exercise, and I somehow I think I was campaigning for mayor was the whole deal, and I was running as a Jedi, and I said something about the number of lightsabers, and Alex, who's a complete meathead jock, all of a sudden got angry because I misquoted the proper number of lightsabers. <laughs> I, th- I think I said there were four, and he was like there. And he completely throws the like the, the whole bit we were doing that like this exercise. He throws it out the window because he got really mad at me for not knowing that. And I'm sitting here, and at first I'm thinking he's just messing with me, and I realize, oh no, he's serious. He's really mad about this. <laughs> and I, he was a huge Star Wars fan. It was just something I never knew. Um, Rick Victor uh, of the Ascension, another one. He's a big comic book guy. Uh, it's just a lot of those things where you figure because it's a it's a physical. You know, they tend people tend to think just because you're into something physical, you're not going to be into pop culture and entertainment like comic books or video games. But the reality is, the same kids that grew up watching wrestling on Saturday and Sunday mornings are the kids that were reading comics and playing video games, and they don't necessarily ever, shall we say, outgrow that that uh, affinity or that fascination. I want to go into your career a little bit, uh, your time in WWE. Uh, you know, when when you get a big call, an important call. Sometimes you, you self doubt yourself. You're like, this has got to be a prank. Someone's, you know, trying to pull my leg. Take us through where you were when you got the call saying, we want you to come and work for WWE. Um, I actually uh, had just gotten fired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a funny story. I was working at a factory, and um, I, the, the shifts at this place were brutal. They were, they were like, uh, they were running like 12, 16 hour shifts, pretty standard. Ooh. So, my hours were really off at the time, and I got a call from Canyon Seaman, who's the head of, uh, of uh, or rather, he was in charge of basically hiring developmental talent. And I kept missing his call, and I couldn't get back to him, couldn't get back to him. And basically, the short version of what happened was they told me, they're like, uh, that um, if we got out this number of parts, I think it was, we'd only have an eight-hour day, we'd be off by five. And I was like, okay, five o'clock, that's still time to call him. This is great. No, so it was three o'clock. That's what it was because it was going to be East Coast time. So I knew I was going to—I was in the Midwest at the time. I would be losing an hour anyway. So I was like, "Okay, I'll still have an hour to get in contact with him while he's in the office. This is great." And a machine broke down, mm. and I had one of those just throw up your hands, what the f moments. <laughs> and they were like, "Okay, you can't do that on the floor. You got to go home right now." So I went home. I called Canyon, and he told me that they were going to sign me, and um, <laughs> that it was. It was, it was, so that was when I was getting my tryout. I'm sorry. I actually got told I was – it was actually very uh, benign when I got told I was getting signed because that was several months later. But it was that whole thing of, like, the buildup, and I was so excited for it. And then I I get the call from uh, my, my day job, and they're like, yeah, um, don't come back. I'm like, okay, cool. Wow. Don't worry. I got another one. Yeah. I've got a new job lined up. I'm good. It worked out. <laughs> So, uh, so you go over to NXT. You uh, you spend some time there. You team up with uh, with Aiden English. You two become the Vaud Villains. Where did that? Where did the Von Villains idea come from? Uh, it was actually Triple H's idea. Um, what I'd gotten told by Dusty Rhodes was that he'd wanted to see us as a team, just because he felt like we sort of had similar aesthetics and uh, we'd work well together. Um, the name itself actually was English's idea, uh, and then. Yeah, you know, it just sort of it came together over the course. Like the short version of it was about a, about two weeks, and the longer version was about I want to say six or seven months. Because the uh, the first time it had been mentioned to me was in I believe October October November of the previous year. Dusty had mentioned that Triple H thought me and English should be a tag team, and then it was the sort of thing where it got brought up every once in a while, like Hey, you know, Triple H thinks you guys should be a tag team, and then when we finally got put together, it was like You guys are a tag team. Triple H wants to see you as a tag team. Like it was, it wasn't put to us as like a hey, try this out. It was a, you're doing this. So, so this is it. happening now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. After being kind of teased for months as like something we had a choice in, and then it was just like, oh no, no, you don't understand. We're actually doing this, and this is how you're going to be put on TV, and this is the angle we're setting up, and this is what we're doing. Wow. So were you uh, were you initially for the idea of of that particular gimmick? Um. Well, the idea was originally like the idea for me in particular was what was uh, William Regal's idea originally, and I'd done that uh, for about my last year on the Indies or so, my last six months on the Indies, um, 
And so when I was brought in, I was already kind of doing that. And the idea of just putting it with a tag team seemed pretty much just in the in the vein of what we could do. I mean, it didn't seem outside of the outside of the realm of possibility. And English's uh, shtick at the time, the whole drama king thing, seemed like it would fit well with it. So it just seemed like a seemed like a pretty natural choice. I mean, I'd actually I'd had it suggested to me that might happen anyway before I was ever signed by a friend of mine who was in developmental. Uh, he wound up being released before I, I started. But he said, "Yeah, there's a guy down here who does this whole thing where he's like the drama king. It's kind of similar to what you do, but not really. Uh, you might, you guys might want to be put as a team." And this was just him spitballing, and it wound up actually happening. So you spent some time in NXT uh, with the VOD villains. Y'all were villainous, to be to say the least. Uh, the crowd uh, turned over to you. Uh, you you became sort of the crowd favorites in NXT, and then you were brought up to the main roster, uh, and. I don't know. There, there just seemed to be sort of that that disconnect. It didn't. It didn't seem to get over with the crowd as well as it did with the NXT uh, crowd. Do you feel like maybe you were called up too soon, or do you think it was just they didn't really have much for you, or wh- where do you think the disconnect was? I don't think it's necessarily a matter of it being too soon. Um, it's one of those things where uh, part of part of the job is really you have to be ready for anything at any time. So I don't think there's really su- such thing as too soon when you have two fully uh, trained and experienced wrestlers going into it. Um, in this particular scenario, I think if there's an issue, it was more along the lines of when we debuted in NXT, the first thing they did with us was a, uh, a backstage vignette, a little promo. Um, then the next week we had a, uh, a match with uh, a couple of the younger guys in NXT to sort of highlight us. And then when we went to our feud with the uh, Lucha Dragons, we had the uh, vignettes with the the with us sort of doing the silent movie thing where we were saving the NXT tag titles from them. Um, we did the whole thing where we called out the two uh, the two little people in in uh, Nacho Libre masks and Lucha Dragon t shirts and beat them up, you know, stuff like that. Where I, I feel like there was a lot uh, we they put a lot of build into it, and then I think it was just a matter of because we were sort of. Uh, fast tracks when we went up to the main roster where we were right into an angle with the New Day. We were right into a storyline. We were right into the tag title tournament. There wasn't really a whole lot of time to do that. So it sometimes sometimes if you need a bigger explanation for what you're doing, if what you're doing is a little uh, abstract, a little unusual, uh, occasionally it helps to have more time on TV, not so much wrestling as much as presenting what you are, presenting the characters and showing what the, the motivation and such is. Um, so it might have just been a matter of when we came up, they needed us for a certain job, and they, we, you know, that was kind of where we had to go right away. And mm. I think we did, we did what we could with it. We did our best, and you know, in the end, it just sort of went as it did. Well, what's your relationship with uh, Aiden English? Did you two uh, develop a bond, a friendship, or was it more sort of a, we're just kind of coworkers and uh, we're going to do our job? Uh, Mostly coworkers. Uh, it, we're, we're too. I think we're we're too similar and too different at the same time to ever really be friends in the way that a lot of the guys are. Um, mostly because we come from different backgrounds. Uh, it, it's, it's actually kind of funny. We could not be more opposite in our backgrounds, but we have similar tastes in a lot of things. Like we both like sort of an obscure uh, cinema. My taste tends to veer toward more towards the uh, disgusting and uh, and unusual B movies. He tends to like sort of. Uh, the uh, abstract European Asian cinema, things like that. Um, I came from, you know, a lower class family. My father was a was a drug addict. Um, my mom was a school teacher. His parents were both, you know, respectable, upstanding citizens who took good care of him. You know, he went to college. I didn't. So we're very kind of opposite people. But I think that was uh, the good thing about that was it actually allowed us to focus on the work as a team and not so much on the friendship. It's I think sometimes when you're friends with your tag partner, this is just my personal opinion. You tend to lose sight of what the goal is, which is to to make the team better. You know, it, it's sometimes harder to look at an idea and say you either agree with it or disagree with it when you're emotionally invested in the person as as your friend. You don't want to be like, uh, I don't think that'll work, or maybe we should try it like this. Or it, it's a little bit harder when you have that bond of friendship because you don't know that you can. You don't really want to hurt your friend's feelings. Mm-hmm. But on, from a professional standpoint, it's like. Do you think this? Do you think this cut off will work? Do you think this spot will work? It'll be like, no, nah, I don't think that's working. Okay, what do you think we should do? How about this? Okay, we can try that. Yeah, let's give that a try tonight. Uh, if it doesn't work, we'll try it the other way tomorrow. Yeah, sure, that'll work. So it tend to it tended to actually make it a little bit easier, I think, for for us than it is for sometimes for some of the other teams. Doing the uh, transition from NXT to the main roster, what was what did you find the the most difficult challenge? Was it the the backstage environment? Was it uh, you know, working in front of the larger crowds, or what? What was the hardest transition for you? I think really it was just the day to day versus the uh, week to week as it was in NXT. Um, with NXT, 
the TV tapings, you did you did one taping every month or every six weeks or sometimes like two in a week, depending, and then you wouldn't do one for three months. You know, mm-hmm. it'd be that sort of thing. Whereas with, with uh, the main roster, it was every single week you had TV. So it was kind of like the difference between sort of knowing where you're going week to week versus uh, – knowing you're not doing anything for three months. Like, you know, if we do this TV taping and we have one match on it and we don't have an angle set up with it, you're like, okay, well, I know then for the next, you know, six weeks of TV, four weeks of TV, whatever it winds up being, I know I don't have anything. Whereas on the main roster, it would be like, okay, do I have anything this week? No. Nope. Okay, well, we'll see next week where we're at. Do we got anything this week? No. Nope. Yes. Okay, we got something? All right, we'll see. We'll see what we have. So it's really just sort of the difference, I think, between – like, NXT is kind of feast or famine when it comes to knowing what you're doing, whereas WWE, like, as a main roster, is more of a, a steady feed. You sort of have an idea of what you're doing week to week based on what you've been doing on house shows and things like that. Gotcha. What do you, uh, during the time off uh, between those NXT tapings, what would you find yourself doing to help pass the time aside from, you know, working in the ring and working out in the gym? Uh, not a whole lot, honestly. Uh, the, the thing is about being in NXT is it's a full-time job in the way that a lot of people might not understand. I mean, you're, you train, you work out at the PC itself. Then, of course, you have uh, th- extra things like uh, extra training, uh, promo classes, things like that. And then you still have the NXT house shows um, that you'll be working on. And those can vary. I mean, some weeks it would be uh, us and Blake and Mur- us versus Blake and Murphy, or the Lucha Dragons, or Dawson Wilder, Enzo and Cass. Like there are so many tag teams in NXT that you you would get a pretty good mix. So it just sort of depended on what you were doing that week. But uh, you don't really have a whole lot of time to do much else. Every once in a while you get a weekend off, but even then it's like you, all you really want to do at that point is rest and and relax because you you know Monday's going to come and you got to be in that ring again. Who did you did you really bond with anyone uh, backstage? Because I, I was trying to do some research in in preparation for the interview, and I saw that maybe it seemed like people felt like you rubbed them the wrong way. So I was wondering, what are your what's your take on that? And then who, who did you bond with? Well, the funny thing is, I've I've heard that before, but it's always these like fifth hand reports on some dirt sheet that that happened, and. So the guy who's leaking the information might not have been a fan of me, but who knows who that is. But uh, I traveled a lot and bonded with uh, Apollo Crews, Kalisto, Mojo Rawley. Um, oddly enough, I always got along real well with Claudio, um, with, with uh, Cesaro. Uh, another example would be um, I, I, I keep my, my first reaction is to call him Brody, uh, but uh, Luke Harper. Uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of a funny story. We were, um, we were staying at the same hotel, me, Luke, and Rick Victor. And they happened to stop in at the Denny's uh, at the same one that I'd stopped at to get dinner because obviously it's right across the street from the hotel. Now we literally just sat there, chatted for a few hours, you know, had our food, whatever. And someone had commented, it's like, you know, you're, uh, you're kind of a weird guy. They didn't mean it in a bad way. They were just saying it. I was like, I'm not a weird guy. They said, oh, yeah, you are. And I went, Luke, you had dinner with me last night, right? He's like, yeah. So was that weird? No, not at all. I was like, see? So, <laughs> so it was one of those things where I actually got along real well with Bray Wyatt, Randy Orton. Uh, Cena always seemed to get along with me. Uh, it's the weirdest thing. All it takes is one person saying something in public, and people tend to assume that it's 100% across the board. That's how it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'd be like if I go to a concert and I don't like the band and I'm reviewing the concert, I'll tell you, oh, this band sucks. There could be 65,000 people at the same concert who love the show, but you're just seeing the review that says from this one guy who happened to be there, oh, this band sucks. No one really likes them. Well, that's his opinion. That's not necessarily the opinion of everyone who's at the show. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we started the conversation with, with comic books, and we, you and I, we all clicked uh, immediately. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. is that it's, very, it's very unusual that uh, you're not going to get along with someone. I've, I've never met anyone who's absolutely that much of a jerk that they didn't get along with anyone. There's usually at least one person you'll get along with, even if you're the worst person in the world. I mean, you have to remember, even serial killers have friends. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're always some of those monstrous people in history have someone who's like, oh, yeah, he was a cool guy. We used to hang out all the time. Mm-hmm. So, it, yeah, it's, I'm, I've never I, – I try not to put much stock in the, in the reports like that because it's one of those things where if I personally am in the middle of it and I'm not seeing it, I, I don't know who would say it. Right. And, and speaking of, of those reports, uh, I – I overheard one of the uh, the shoots, air shoots uh, that Ryback made, claiming he he oh, was God. not very fond of you. So I was wondering, was there something that happened backstage between you two, or is it just uh, yeah, we just we're just two different people? 
we had next to no actual contact. It's really funny because when I when someone was telling me this happened or that he was saying this stuff, I was like, that seems really unusual. I don't even remember talking to him all that much, if at all. I think I think we had like one conversation on a bus in uh, in England. So I looked it up and I tried to find what it was. And the thing he actually credited it to, so this is him. This is him saying this, is that his last day in the company, which I don't know it's his last day. I don't know he's he's going to quit. I He's just another day to me. I interrupted him while he was talking to Dolph Ziggler. And I thought back, and I was like, if this is the conversation I'm thinking of, I think it was John Cohn or one of the guys from Talent Relations uh, was literally looking for Dolph. And I just saw him. I was like, oh, hey, Dolph, uh, I don't mean to, uh, sorry to interrupt, but have you had a chance to talk to Cohn yet? And he said, oh, yeah, I already talked to him. I said, okay, cool. And that was it. <laughs> How dare you, sir? How dare you? <laughs> I, I know. I literally even said, I'm, you know, I don't mean to interrupt, but so it gets even better because when I'm trying to find this out, because I was like, that was that it? Was that really all that happened? Because I didn't remember anything else happening, and that was the only one I could think of. Uh, I come across this, this article um, from some, I don't know, it was like What Culture or, or uh, No DQ, one of those sites. And it's like, Ryback says he forgives CM Punk, life's too short to hold grudges. <laughs> so, so I am thinking of like so all the stuff Punk has said over the years about Ryback, all the intensely negative whether they were true or not, I'm not judging, I don't know, I wasn't there, but for all the things he said about Ryback that were pretty inflammatory, that's forgivable. <laughs> but one time I had the audacity to apo- to apologetically interrupt. That's unforgivable. How dare I? I I'm I'm, a, I'm the worst person in the world, I know. <laughs> Grudges shall be held. Um <laughs> so, okay, um, you know, obviously in, in light of recent weeks, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding uh, uh, John Brashaw, Layfield, and Mauro Ronaldo. Uh, I don't know if, if you have any insight in it, but you would, you would probably have more insight than I personally because I don't get to be backstage. What was your take on, on the reports that came out as opposed to maybe your interactions with JBL and Mauro? Take, could you take us through that a little bit? Um, I couldn't really comment on it all that deeply because I had minimal to any interactions with JBL, usually just like a high and a buy at the beginning and end of the day. Um, I always got along real well with Mauro. We both are big fans of Japanese wrestling, so we could talk about that a lot. Um, but once again, our conversations were always sort of uh, wrestling or fighting based. You know, we mm-hmm. talk wrestling, we talk MMA. Uh, occasionally, I would I would talk about how much I loved his brothers. Uh, I met his uh, two brothers at WrestleMania in Dallas, and I was dying laughing the whole time because they're the most Canadian people I've ever met. <laughs> they're if you've ever seen Strange Brew, the McKenzie brothers, they were like they're like spot on the McKenzie brothers. And I guess one and one of them's a sheriff's deputy, the other one's a police officer. But they're <laughs> word for word, they sound like the McKenzies, and I was just I was just That's absolutely awesome. enamored with how hilarious it was. Um, <laughs> So I've always gotten along with Mauro. He's always been real cool with me. I've always liked him. Um, I don't know what I don't know if something happened or what happened. I don't know the extent of it. Uh, that's really kind of up to them to to tell the story as as they experienced it. I can't really you know, I can't really add anything to it. Okay. Uh, and of course, you know, here recently you were uh, were granted a release. I uh, would like to talk a little bit about that. What was the meeting like for your release? It did, I mean, was it an, an okay conversation? Is the door open for a future return? Would you even want to return? Kind of take us take us through that. Well, it's kind of a funny story. I'd, uh, it was Wednesday. It was the day after SmackDown at, uh, it, at the uh, arena here in Orlando. I go out to a Korean barbecue. I come home. I, I put on the new episode of uh, Attack on Titan, episode one for season two. <laughs> and episode ends. And I look at my phone, I see I have a missed call from Mark Carano, and I'm like, well, I think I know what this is. Mm. So I called him back, and we, we had a conversation, and he basically said that uh, the feeling was that the character had run its course, and the company wanted to exercise its, uh, its right to, to uh, terminate my contract early. And I agreed. I felt the character had run its course, and that you know, that was probably the best course of action. And that was that. Um, I don't know if a door would be open or closed to, to a return, obviously it's the old cliche in wrestling is to never say never. I mean, there've been plenty of guys in the past 10 years who've been released and then brought back uh, Jinder Mahal, a good example. Um, Kurt Hawkins, you know, the, and Drew McIntyre even recently where it's these people who a lot of guys probably would have said, Oh, well, they'll never be back. They're done, whatever. And then, you know, a few years later, tides change. They're looking for people. They know they can trust these guys. 
And also, if, if once again they believed that all I had to offer was this particular character and they'd sort of used it to the extent they wanted to, then I have the opportunity now with uh, with my return to the independent scene in uh, July to sort of show that I um, actually have a lot more to offer than just that. Very cool. Uh, if uh, if New Japan, Impact, and Lucha called you on the same day and said, we want you to come work for us, who would you pick? New Japan, in a heartbeat. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Japanese wrestling. It's always been my, my desire to work over there. It's it's really the thing I'm most passionate about when it comes to wrestling. It, it, like, there's some people they want to sit down and they want to watch. You know, for some for some people it's you know Sean and Razor in the ladder match. For some people it's Hogan Andre at WrestleMania three. For some people it's Flair Steamboat in any one of the 85 million matches they had that were amazing. But if you if you want to get me going, if you want to get me just super excited, you you put down you put on you know Masawa and Kawada or uh, Kobashi and Akiyama or Kensuke Sasaki or Minoru Suzuki, one of those guys, and I'll I'll be glued to the TV just in awe of the sheer ferocity of the matches. I mean, that, that's, that's always been my thing. Very cool. Uh, so with, with all of that that's been said, what's next for you? You said, you said that you'll be uh, returning to the independent uh, promotions in uh, July. Uh, so do you have some already lined up? I do have a few lined up already. Uh, I officially am free from my 90-day no-compete on July 8th. And uh, at that point, I, I have some shows starting to set, get set up then. Uh, I'll actually be over in England for about 10 days uh, at the end of July for XWA and uh, Pro Wrestling Pride, uh, which actually is kind of cool because I'll have the opportunity to, to wrestle Doug Williams, which is one of those things that I, I've always actually wanted to do. I, I, one of, when I first started training, I'll, I'll throw this in here, um, in August of 2001 was when I started training. And at the time, I uh, was was going to All Pro Wrestling in uh, Hayward, California, famous from uh, the Barry Blaustein documentary, Beyond the Mat. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did a tournament called King of the Indies, which wound up actually being kind of the prototype for Ring of Honor. A lot of the guys you saw in early Ring of Honor uh, were first competing against each other, really, in in uh, King of the Indies. Guys like Daniel Bryan, uh, Adam Pierce, Samoa Joe, Loki, Doug, um, AJ Styles, and all these guys would obviously eventually go on to be sort of the first generation of uh, Ring of Honor guys. And there was a match. I was I had to I had, I had to be backstage for security. There's a match between Doug Williams and American Dragon Daniel Bryan. And match finishes. I'm just hearing people cheering the whole time. Like I can't see anything because where I'm, I'm standing. And they come to the back, and they're both just beaten and bloodied. And I'm like, oh my god, what did I miss? <laughs> this is a fan. I was like, I, I, I didn't get to see it. Now I really want to see this match. <laughs> and so it's kind of cool for me to finally get an opportunity to work with Doug. Um, which is going to be happening on, I believe, July 28th. Very nice. cool. Um, like you said, you, you want to wrestle uh, Doug Williams. Is there like uh, some other guys that you're looking forward to wrestling? There, obviously, there's, there's a lot of, out there right now that I'd really like to have an opportunity to work with. Uh, I'm good friends with Sammy Callahan. Um, hoping to get a chance to work with him. Uh, see Shane Strickland, Leo Rush. I mean, there are a lot of guys out there right now that are really just killing it uh, uh, geez, I mean, trying to pick one. I mean, and that's just Americans. It's not even kind of you got this wealth of British talent now that's come up. It's amazing. The the guys in uh, in uh, Mustache Mountain, obviously Trent Seven and uh, and Tyler Bate would be great ones to work with. Uh, if I had the opportunity, I mean, there's so much talent in Japan as well. Uh, Katsuyori Shibata, Okada. I mean, just amazing guys over there. I mean, it's really it's really like a buffet of talented wrestlers. I actually have to say, if if you really look at it right now, the current era we're in has some of the widest spread talent in years just everywhere you go there are guys who are good it, it's not that you know you can go to this promotion but there's gonna be one guy worth looking at and everybody else is kind of garbage it's actually an era where you have so much talent around now it's it's a lot more fun to work than it used to be absolutely and they all get to make their rounds so if you don't get to fight them at this show you, hey you go to this promotion next week and they'll be there so it's uh it's, exactly it's really cool to to see all the all the talent and we wish you nothing but the best and uh hope to hope to see you at one of the shows down down the road. Like I said, for all information, you can follow uh, Simon on Twitter and Instagram. Currently, Gotch Style WWE. I saw one of the comments that uh, one of your fans left. It was like, "Hey, I don't mean to to you know rub you the wrong way or anything, but why don't why don't you change it?" And you say, "Hey, it takes it takes time to get that changed." It, it does if you have the verification. Which selfishly, I mean, as as a human being, I should be able to say it's just a blue check mark. It has no actual <laughs> value. But there's that part of me that goes, uh, but I, I have the, the verification right now, and I'd almost rather take the time to just do the, do it through the proper channels to mm -hmm. get my, my handle changed. Because if you change your username, 
on Instagram or Twitter, when you have verification, it immediately revokes your verification. That's the first thing they do. <laughs> so there's that part of me that goes, oh, I could just change it and then you know reapply, but then there's part of me that goes, ah, uh, do you really want to go through that process, or should you just try and take the slower road and get it done by them? And so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm trying to take the slower road for right now, but I'll probably just end up getting impatient and changing it anyway. Very cool. Well, like I said, best of luck to you. Thank you again so much for uh, for coming on the show. We certainly yeah, thanks, do man. appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me, guys. It was a pleasure.